the reason that I chose the title Faith, Hope, and Politics is because we're seeing this odd weirdness around faith and around politics, and all of it has to do with hope. And I thought it was a bit of a pun, but it was also an important thing for us to realize that you can't do any of what we do in the world without faith and hope. And you can't do anything with anyone else without politics. So there we are. <laughs> right. So the, go the goal is to look at three different questions. Basically, what's going on in the world? Where are we headed? And then what can we do about it? Okay. So this is the first part. We're going to have three parts. <laughs> what's happening and how we got here. And then the second part will be where is it headed? And then the third part will be focusing on what you can do about it. The first part is going to be pretty heady and for some people it's pretty distressing. And just know that we don't have to be stuck there in the distress. Okay, second, next slide. So what I wanna talk about is what we actually have as a political system. How was it designed? And we need to understand that it was a republic and not a democracy. Yeah, and we need to understand that the function of this system is, you know, got rulers as well as ruled people and unruly, which was not the intention in the beginning. And we want to understand how the current mess we are in actually happened. Next slide. So let's look at the video that explains why America is a republic and not a democracy. So, okay. There you go. The law. This is the essence of a republic. Fine. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution, nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Alexander Hamilton agreed, and he stated, We are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, stated, Democracy never lasts long, it soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon, who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the Twelve Tables of the Roman Law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. 
Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Right. Eventually the whole system came crashing down. They and they shifted into the dictatorship and ultimately the empire. Thank you. So our founders were very familiar with this history. Some of you are familiar with Barbara Tuckman's work, the Pulitzer Prize historian, and she called the group of people who put together the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, 50 of the most intelligent, best educated human beings ever gathered anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So what were the sources and assumptions these guys were using when they were putting these together? Fundamentally, it was British common law, which was begun with the Magna Carta, although it was by no means established with the Magna Carta. That was about the barons saying, King, you don't have the right to tell us what to do. But after that, over time, as it evolved, what British common law says is that everyone has the right to do anything as long as they harm no one. Wow. And I remember when I was growing up, my mother, who was very active during the war in the, in the military and in, grew up in a social worker's environment and all those good things, used to say, freedom, everyone is totally free to do anything that doesn't hurt someone else. That's British common law. And it's turning out that British common law is being resurrected in some of those places we are very concerned about in the world. It, you may be aware that there's this little tiny island in the Red Sea that was just a lump of sand a while back, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and is now one, the ninth largest economy in the world, the banking center for that region. And it's because even though they kept... Arabic law, Muslim law, but they shifted to British common law for business. In the area of business, they allowed the kinds of freedoms that British common law permits. So that's why Bahrain is what it is. All right, so then there's another set of sources and assumptions. And this is what I call empire culture. Hellenistic empire culture has continued through the Roman Empire, through the Holy Roman Empire, through the Roman Church Empire, through the British Empire and the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese to the American Empire. Now, I recognize we don't have an emperor and it isn't a dynasty, but we have military presence in 40 different countries in the world. We have 172 bases outside of the U.S. And they are all there to support business in all those other countries. We are an empire, whether we like it or not. And the uh, global culture is based on America in more ways than one. And we'll talk more about that as we go. The fundamental values of this way of living were established about 4000 BC as waves of very large, very muscular, very powerful and demanding men came out of the Caucasus Mountains, hence Caucasians, and called themselves children of the light and took over the relatively egalitarian gardening villages and hunting gathering groups all through Asia and up into Europe. The wave after wave, every 200 years, it's documented in my book, Madonna, Magdalene and Beyond, the history of that emerging period that they actually started showing up about 8,000 BC and by 4,000 BC were thoroughly entrenched in the Mesopotamian Fertile Crescent area. And we have the very first emperor declaring himself an emperor, Sargon. And he follows a mythic structure that drew from the old egalitarian traditions. And I can give you the details on that in another time. But his values and the values of every empire since has been, have been, we want to acquire everything we can accumulate as much as we can, and then control. We want to control thing, things, and we want to control everybody else. 
A second piece of that set of values is the people who are in control are people, and the people who aren't are barely more than animals. And you have seen that in many, many ways all across the world. Yes. So that's a second piece that unfortunately our founders were so deeply grounded in, they didn't even see it. They didn't, most of them didn't even recognize that this was part of their way of thinking. And then the next piece is something they were very much aware of, and that is Plato's Republic, which all of them had read in the original Greek, because that was part of either homeschooling or formal education, such as it was at the time. And they were also very familiar, as I was when I was in high school studying Latin, with Cicero, Cicero's commentaries on the shift from the Republic of Rome into the dictatorship of Rome. His commentaries on Julius, who became Caesar, are scathing. <laughs> and they knew that material. And then the next source, and the one that we hear most about in recent years, is the Bible. And I have a video where someone talks about what that really was and how the founders were thinking. There are many quotations from and allusions to both familiar as well as obscure scriptural texts tell us that they knew the Bible from cover to cover. And let's not forget that this was a generation which, in which many learned to read with a copy of the Bible open in front of them. So again, this is a generation that knew the Bible well. And we find that biblical language and themes liberally seasoned their rhetoric. The phrases and the cadences of the King James Bible especially. And if you know the King James, you know it has this very distinctive rhythm to it. And you hear that rhythm of the King James Bible in much of the literature, in much of the discourse of the American founding. The ideas of the Bible shaped the founding generation's habits of mind and informed their political pursuits. The Bible was an accessible and authoritative text, perhaps the most accessible text for 18th century Americans. And so it's not going to surprise us that effective communicators like politicians and polemicists often appealed to the Bible in, in an effort to reach, to connect with their audiences. Now let's be very clear here. The mere fact that a founder quoted the Bible does not indicate whether that individual was a believer or a skeptic. Both, including some who doubted the Bible's divine origins and some of the central claims of Christianity, appealed frequently to scripture in their political discourse. And, and here I might point to something like Thomas Paine in The Common Sense. So these were the foundations which the founders were working on when they were building this thing that had never existed before. A union of isolated states agreeing to work together who had formerly been colonies of another you know, empire somewhere else, located somewhere else, and were saying, okay, we, we disagree on a lot of things. The folks in Maine didn't think slaves were appropriate. The folks in North Carolina couldn't imagine life without them, etc. But nonetheless, we agree on some things. And what we agree on are those sources and assumptions. And therefore, we will design something that allows for that. And what they designed was a republic based on democratic processes. And I think that's an important thing to be aware of. We talk about, as you use, we talk about, you know, the importance of the democratic process. And that's one of our principles. But we are not saying that everything should be a democracy, that it is direct rule by the mob, if you will, by the majority, that it is the majority selecting people who then put together things that the majorities are willing and the minorities to put up with. So we have representation. And the Constitution does not address what goes on at representation in the state and the local areas because the Constitution is about the states, the colonies that are becoming states. So we have representation at the federal level, 
where the states elect representatives. And then those representatives select an executive in the original constitution. We'll talk about that. We also then, because the states didn't have a better model to work with, they used the federal constitution as their models. So generally, the states followed pretty much the same model as the federal constitution and also established two houses of legislature and an executive branch and a separate judiciary. Now, what that means is that there are local elections and there are state elections, and there are national elections, and the separate judiciary is handled differently in each state and at the federal level. Something to be aware of. So we're going to be talking about who is the electorate. One of the issues that's coming up today is who were those founders and who did they decide would vote? Well, what they decided What they decided was the head of every household, the property owner, should vote. So that represents the whole household. We see that as the male landowner. Isn't that interesting? The assumption was that the wife and the husband together were working together. They were a team. If you've ever read any of the biographies of the founders, you're aware of this, especially the John and Abigail Adams letters. Oh, my goodness. But all the way back into the Puritans, Jonathan Edwards' letters, one of my minors as an undergrad was American literature. You know, fascinating stuff, how they were living and how they were sharing their understandings and informing each other and supporting each other. So the assumption was that each household, each piece of property in the country would help to select the leadership of the country. The Civil War and the 14th Amendment changed that, and it said that anyone born in the U.S. was a citizen, and every citizen, still male, had the right to vote. They didn't yet say every person, they were still saying every man. And it took World War I and the decimation of World War I, and the incredible work of all those amazing suffragettes, oh my goodness, putting up with every possible kind of humiliation and pain in many cases, to allow and convince everybody that the male was not the only mind, <laughs> and that it was possible, not only possible, but essential that the female be included in this. So we have both men and women being allowed to vote after World War I. I think it's interesting to note that immediately after the Civil War or during the Civil War, we lost a huge number of men. And the number of women who were working as professionals, the percentage of women who were working as professionals after Civil War was greater than the percentage of women working as professionals in 1973. 1873, more women than in 1973, more proportionately. And so during that 100 years, a lot had shifted and changed. Again, during World War I, we lost a huge number of men, but then we also lost a whole lot of people in the Spanish flu immediately after that. So the significance wasn't felt as intensely after World War I, but it did contribute to people's willingness to make the shift. Now, the other piece that is part of this democratic process that the founders created is the concept of electors, all right? And the idea was that the, the, when you elected your Congress people, you would also be electing the people who would select the executive. It was not a direct popular vote. Never intended to be. It's kind of like we elect a board of directors for a congregation, and generally the board of directors chooses their officers. We don't always, in a congregation, choose the officers at the congregational level. So the number of electors to represent whatever was related to the party that they were elected from. So if you elected, say you had six combination senators and representatives, congressmen, then if four of those were Democrats and two of them were Republican, then you would have four 
Democrat electors and to Republican electors, except in some states. There are some states where whoever gets the most, whichever party gets the most people in office, that party has all the electors. And that was part of what came up in the last couple of elections, that we saw there's this weird disparity. And that disparity we'll talk about uh, as we go forward. Political parties. The founders never expected there to be political parties. It never occurred to them that people would get together and choose a candidate. But it became very clear very quickly that the ones who liked what Hamilton had to say and the ones who liked what Jefferson had to say were in very two different camps, two very different camps. And so they started, you know, putting together different approaches and getting different candidates for different offices. So we began to have two parties until after a while, the Federalists, the Alexander Hamilton folks died away, mostly because Alexander Hamilton was no longer on the planet, as anyone who has seen the show Hamilton knows. So in 1824, though, we had, had this one-party system, but John Quincy Adams took the presidency even though Andrew Jackson got the popular vote. So suddenly we had two parties again. <laughs> so it didn't last too long. And so Democrats went one way. They seemed to be focusing on states' rights, they were against the idea of a centralized bank, et cetera. And the Whigs tended to be focused on, you know, getting a central bank and supporting big business as much as we can and making it possible for people to do very well. Well, there were a few people who didn't like any of that, and they formed a Republican Party, <laughs> which Abraham Lincoln was one of the founding members of in the mid-1850s. And so we get the Republicans electing Abraham Lincoln into the presidency, and neither the Democrats nor the Whigs are happy, and literally he had to be in disguise to get to the White House because everyone knew he wasn't going to make it there alive. Next slide, please. All right. So as that emerged, then the Republican Party was more and more focusing after the war on economic growth. Let's get the union back together again. Let's make it work. Let's get the, the economic engine working and, and that idea that we had to grow the economy. Now, keep in mind that somewhere in between all of that, we had accumulated the whole Louisiana territory <laughs> and we were growing. <laughs> we were moving westward. We were about acquire, accumulate, and control all the way across the continent. That was what this country was doing. And the Republicans were very happy to facilitate that. And then we got into the 1920s and we had the market crash and that horrid, quote unquote, fellow in the White House, Mr. Hoover, was responsible. And I was noticing the other day how similar our current camps are to what used to be called Hoovervilles. In case you wonder what our economic state really is. All right. So then, in response to that, of course, the Democrats put together a coalition saying, you don't want that. We're going to change that. And they got Franklin Roosevelt up and running. And then, as you know, Roosevelt got three terms, but he didn't make it through the third term. Truman took over the end of his term. And unfortunately, it fell to Truman's lot to have to try to prevent the projected killing of two million soldiers by dropping an incendiary bomb on a town called Hiroshima. He had no idea what the long-term consequences of that would be. He was just told that that was what would happen. It was one or the other. And I can understand why he thought that one decision was appropriate. Unfortunate that we didn't have any idea what it was really about and unfortunate that war happens at all. I will I'll get into that another time. <laughs> but Truman continued to you know, work with the democratic policies that he and Roosevelt had worked on. And um, for those who think of the Democratic Party as a party of mostly rich people in these days, when Truman got out of office, he had no pension, 
He had no budget at all. He was handwriting and buying the stamps for all the letters that he was responding to from all the people who were sending him letters after he was out of office in his own little home in Missouri that he had bought when he ran a hat dealership prior to going into politics. Wow. The world has changed. All right. Then that way of thinking that was pretty much established by Roosevelt and maintained by Truman wasn't rocked too much by Eisenhower. And Kennedy's ideas really weren't that very far removed, except for civil rights and a couple of other things, from what we would call centrist today. And in fact, some people say that a lot of Democrats became Republicans under Ronnie Reagan because they thought those were the same policies that Kennedy had. They were Kennedy Democrats and Reagan Republicans. But what Reagan did was got himself elected with very social conservative policies. And what he did as a president was undo a lot of what Truman and Roosevelt had put in place. And we are still in some ways paying the price for that. And we can talk about that on an economic seminar if you want sometime. All right, but he was emphasizing cutting taxes, preserving family values, increasing military funding, and he defined what became the Republican Party platform. And we can watch this video to understand a little more about the importance of parties. Van Buren started looking at the politics of the 1820s, 1830s, and said the problem of our politics is that we don't have strong political parties. What we need is two, and only two, political parties. And what Van Buren started to theorize is what 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, there's a political scientist named Anthony Downs. You don't need to remember that. That's, there's no quiz. And he wrote a book called An Economic Theory of Democracy. And what Downs theorized and what Van Buren theorized without the cool chart, you might rem remember this. This is a normal curve, giving you nightmares from high school math class. And what they both theorize is that political opinions are distributed normally. So therefore, most people are in the middle. And if you have two and only two political parties, the parties will have an incentive to run towards the middle because that's where most people are. And this creates moderation and helps us avoid extremism. The other thing is, is we tend to think Republicans think this, Democrats think that, but that's not really true, is it? There are more progressive and more moderate Democrats. There are more moderate and more conservative Republicans. Really what you need to do in this system in order to be competitive is you need to form a big, broad-based coalition party. You need to show people who have superficial differences that they have enough in common that they should join together for a common cause. Think of Franklin Roosevelt and the famous New Deal coalition of the 1930s, where he showed urban laborers, rural farmers, and racial minorities that despite their differences, they had enough in common that they should join the Democratic Party, and they did. Right? And so what we started creating in the, in the 1830s is what I call the party system. Right? a system of very strong political parties. And this system brought us good things. I've already talked about moderation, the avoidance of political extremism. A government based on coalitions of parties, parties who are big coalitions, which means there's moderation within the parties. We get more effective government, because when you think about it, most electoral offices in the United States are legislative offices. Look at the US Congress. There are 535 House and Senate members of Congress, but only one president. Well, what is the job of, of a legislator? A, a job of a legislator is to take people with superficial differences, show them that they have enough in common to join a coalition in order to pass a piece of legislation. Look, what is successful electorally is tied to what is successful in government. So you can see why they thought this was such a good idea. And it seemed to be working in many ways. There was also a lot of corruption, but that we'll get into that in a minute. So next slide, please. So to a large extent, they're accurate. These are the basic American values, the well-being of self and family, reduced suffering for all people, access to opportunities, and potential of possibilities. This is what it means to be an American. And it's different from what it means to be an Arab or you know, an Indonesian or any number of other cultures in the world. 
And what we've tended to do historically, as he said, is we tend to think of Republicans, the red side over here, as you know, having a one set of ways of doing those values, of acquiring, of experiencing those values, and the Democrats is having another one. For example, that the Democrats suggest that if we're going to manage people, we want to do that with the government. There ought to be a law. We need a regulation of something if people aren't doing it in a way that is useful or helpful for others. Whereas the Republicans are saying, no, 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 that's what church and school and families are for. That's where you do the management level. The Democrats say the state should support you know, the people who are deprived or workers and the Republicans are, no, you, the state should support business and the business will make sure that the people are not deprived and that workers are taken care of, et cetera. We can go through the list, but they're all trying to do the same thing. And it is sort of a bell-shaped curve, sort of. <laughs> Next slide, please. So with that in mind now, we have an election system that's based on all of those ideas that's managed at the level of the state and the county. Even though we're electing sometimes federal offices, we're managing at the level of the state and the county. We're requiring proof of citizenship to vote and we're requiring proof of registration in order to vote. You have to prove you're a citizen to register, et cetera. Now we're starting to see all kinds of new things happening out there, aren't we, in the world, where different states are saying, eh, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it anymore. So everyone is exploring other ways to accomplish those same things that they were trying to accomplish, but with different means. And I'm definitely getting into why these new ideas are coming up. The other piece is you have to register for a party. If you don't register for a party, you don't get to choose the candidates. You know, I've registered as independent often in my life, knowing I have hereby given up my right to help choose who's going to run for some of those national offices. Wow. And I had a thought a few months ago. We, our state pays for the rights of a private club to decide who they're going to push as a candidate for officers. Hmm. Is that what I really want to have happen? <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, then we vote on specific dates for specific offices and specific measures. We don't just say, okay, we need to know. You know, in Britain, at any time, they can have an instant vote. You know, they will, they will know by tomorrow morning possibly who the next prime minister is. We could never accomplish that, right? <laughs> All right. And then there is this other thing called electors. And the electors are ratified by Congress. And who knows what's going to happen with this new bill that just came through the House. So this whole system is in flux right now in almost every state in the country. Fascinating. After about 100 years. <laughs> All right. So how is it functioning now? Let's look at this next YouTube. Healthy competition incentivizes businesses to make better products. Better products equals happier customers, and happier customers equals successful businesses. Win-win. Now, while I was running Gale Foods, I was also deeply engaged in and increasingly frustrated by politics. The more frustrated I got, the more I wondered why competition in politics didn't deliver the same kind of win-win results. How do the Democrats and the Republicans keep doing so well when their customers, that's us, are so unhappy? Why is the politics industry win-lose? They win, we lose. The answer, it turns out that one thing almost all Americans agree on, Washington is broken, is also one thing we're all wrong about. Washington isn't broken. It's doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's just not designed to serve us, the citizens, the public interest. Most of the rules in politics are designed and continuously fine-tuned by and for the benefit of private gain-seeking organizations. 
That's the two parties, a textbook duopoly, and the surrounding companies in the business of politics. And they're all doing great. Even as the American public has never been more dissatisfied. Said another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. Yeah, that is what it has evolved into. Those coalitions have become businesses, many of them. And there are many, both nonprofit and for profit organizations, that make a lot of money. How many millions of dollars just to get? a Congress seat anymore? All right, so that's a first issue we have to deal with, that our system of representation is no longer people representing people at the federal level and increasingly at the state level. It is usually happening at the local level, but it's even a problem there. I've lived in many cities in this country and you know some of them are totally inaccessible the leadership is totally inaccessible all right then there's this other piece <laughs> the whole thing about districts all right so i'm gonna have someone explain gerrymandering to us and that's the next youtube so you want to know what gerrymandering is first let's start with government 101 in the united states each state elects a certain number of representatives based on the state's population the larger your population, the more representatives you have. Each representative represents a district or a geographical area including its voters. Ideally, we want to have a range of representatives who reflect the political views of the population across the state. But how do we decide who gets to vote for each representative? Let's look at an example. Suppose we have a very tiny state of 50 people. 30 of them belong to the Blue Party and 20 belong to the Red Party. And just our luck, they all live in a nice even grid with blues on one side of the state and reds on the other. Now, let's say we need to divide the state into five districts. Each district will send one representative to the House to represent the people. Fortunately, because our citizens live in a neatly ordered grid, it's easy to draw five lengthy districts, two for the reds and three for the blues. Voila! Perfectly proportional representation, just as the founders intended. Now, let's say instead that the Blue Party controls the state government, and they get to decide how the lines are drawn. Rather than draw districts horizontally, they draw them vertically, so that in each district there are six blues and four reds. With a comfortable blue majority in the state, each district elects a blue candidate to the House. The blues win five seats, and the reds don't get a single one. Oh well! Finally, what if the Red Party controls the state government? The Reds know they're at a numerical disadvantage, but with some creative boundary drawing, they can slice the blue population up such that they only get a majority in two districts. So despite making up 40% of the population, the Reds win 60% of the seats. Not bad. This process of redrawing district lines to give an advantage to one party over another is called gerrymandering, and it's nothing new. The term gerrymander is named after early 19th century Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry, who redrew the map of the Senate's districts in 1810 in order to weaken the opposing Federalist Party. Our example is of course a huge simplification. In the real world, people don't live in neatly ordered grids sorted by political party. But for politicians looking to give themselves an advantage at redistricting time, the process is exactly the same, and the consequences are very real. Gerrymandering is at least partly to blame for lopsided representation in the House seen in recent elections. And, it's been argued by the President, for political polarization, since representatives don't have to compromise hardline views in order to win seats. That is the best description of that I have ever seen. I'm going to flip down to the next slide and I'm going to come back. Actually, yeah. So in Oregon, um, we have a, a number of levels, shall we say. Every urban area is located in a county. We have 35 counties. We have 30 state Senate districts. We have 60 state representative districts. And the next slide. No, I'm, next slide. All right. And we have what were five, going to be six, uh, congressional districts. And I had a different slide at one point. This is almost all Republican. 
And this is almost all Democrats. <laughs> and this is mixed. And this is mixed in the new layout. It's kind of interesting that we have that. All right, now back up to, thank you. So the point that I was going to make is that at the state, the federals have, the state have all the issues to deal with in terms of representation that the feds have, but they also have to put up with everything that the feds tell them they have to do. Have you ever heard of allocation without appropriation or mandate without appropriation? If you're in the education system, you've definitely heard this. We, we're told we have to do something and not given the money to do it. And I learned recently that there are a number of titles, federal titles, that school districts are given you. They're told they have to spend the money before the end of the you know, fiscal year, but they don't receive the guidelines on what is appropriate spending until after the fiscal year is over. Yeah, so they have to track it, not knowing whether they're doing it right or not. And that's kind of an issue at the state level dealing with the federal government. And then the local have everything that the federal issues are dealing with, the federal representation and government issues, plus, including mandates for that appropriation, plus all of the stuff that's going on with the city, the county, the state, the executive, the state executive, the state representatives, the state senate, this, and the U.S. rep and senate and federal exec. And every one of those has their own agenda and mandates. You know, I've, I've helped people get onto city councils and generally, they wished they hadn't <laughs> when they realize all of this. They thought they had some power. They thought they could make things happen, but they got all that coming down. Thanks. So we can go back through and look at Oregon again, realizing that each one of these districts has a totally different set of things that they have to deal with, that mandates, expectations, et cetera. And the next slide, that each one of these congressional districts has been designed to keep the content as cohesive as possible. Let me put it that way. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Let's go on and look at the issue that comes up when politics are based on the next election. Let's start with bad rule number one, party primaries. You all know primaries, those first round elections that we mostly ignore the ones that identify the single Republican and the single Democrat who can appear on the November general election ballot. Party primaries have become low turnout elections dominated by highly ideological voters and special interests. Candidates know that the only way to make it to the general election ballot in November is to win the favor of these more extreme partisans in the primary. So candidates from both parties have little choice but to move towards those extremes. Why does this matter? Because it dramatically affects governing and not in a good way. Imagine you're a member of Congress. You're deciding how to vote on a bipartisan bill that addresses a critical national challenge. You might ask yourself, is this a good idea? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? But that's not how it works in the politics industry. Instead, the question that matters most to you is, will I win my next party primary if I vote for this bill? The answer is almost always no. Consensus solutions don't win party primaries. Let's illustrate this key design flaw with a Venn diagram. In the current system, there's virtually no intersection, no connection between Congress acting in the public interest and the likelihood of their getting reelected. If America's elected representatives do their jobs the way we need them to, they're likely to lose those jobs. That is crazy. No wonder Congress doesn't get anything done. All right, so that's a huge part of it, right? A next piece that's happening is an historical process, a cultural process. When we were growing up, everyone in this room, the primary thing that was taught in churches as well as in governments was what we call the social gospel, based on the golden rule, 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but also taking care of each other, being kind to each other, being open to each other, doing what we can to support each other, being willing to put up with people who are different from us. All of that is woven into the social gospel. It's the essence of Presbyterian and Methodist and, you know, the mainstream, not mainline, that's about heroin, mainstream churches, <laughs> right? Right. So because of a number of historical processes and factors, that is no longer the dominant narrative in Christianity. What has emerged is an attachment to the authoritarian doctrine of a particular group of interpreters of a particular part of the New Testament. So we no longer have the dominant thinking in this country being what we now call liberal religious thinking, right? The social doctrine of the Christian tradition. Another piece that has happened started with Clarence Thomas. The guy who was uh, um, what, uh, not appointed but nominated for the Supreme Court prior to Clarence Thomas was not selected because he was an originalist. And an originalist was too extreme for our 1980s and 90s Congress to put up with prior to Newt Gingrich's Congress. You could not have an originalist. Now, an originalist is someone who says what the original con uh, Constitution says must apply as it was written to today. There is no room for evolving it. There is no room for allowing any social change. Now, that had not been the norm in the Supreme Court for many, many years, like 50, 60 years prior to that point. However, there was this person who got onto the court named Clarence Thomas, and he is an originalist. And it turns out, if you really look at these people that people are so upset about on the court today, almost all of them are in that same place. They are all saying that it doesn't matter that the culture is different. What matters is what the document says. And so the rulings are more and more extreme during as a result. So those three things have done a lot of work that have led to the point we're at today. I'm going to skip the parties video. That's that same guy up there telling us about the values and all of that. And he's just saying they got separated and I'm going to do that in another way. But the Democrats becoming socialists is a very interesting piece. No term is misused in American politics more than the word socialism. Liberals use it to describe countries like Norway and Denmark, while conservatives use it as a slur to criticize things like minimum wage increases and Medicare for all. Fox News once even used it to criticize billionaire investor Warren Buffett when he publicly supported raising taxes on the very wealthy. Warren Buffett wrote an op-ed. Is he completely a socialist? <laughs> Is Warren Buffett a socialist? <laughs> you really have no clue what socialism is, do you? Unfortunately, most Americans have no clue what socialism is either, and they definitely don't know how democratic socialism fits into the whole picture. Even though traditional definitions of socialism don't actually fit the current political narratives in the US, let's take a look at where these terms came from. Historically speaking, socialism was seen as somewhat of a halfway point between capitalism and communism. Under this spectrum, democratic socialism fits somewhere in between capitalism and socialism, and the policies that Bernie Sanders and AOC are proposing Proposing, things like Medicare for All and Free College would fall somewhere between capitalism and democratic socialism, an area that analysts typically call social democracy. So what do all these terms mean? Capitalism is all about letting the free market generate unlimited profits for corporations and individuals. The downside of capitalism is that when it's unregulated, it leads to things like child labor, contaminated air and water, and the concentration of wealth in the hands of very few. 
communism is about creating a classless society with absolute equality, where the government dictates the price, supply, and distribution of goods. The downside of communism is that the only practical way to redistribute wealth with absolute equality is by force. So these governments usually end up becoming authoritarian regimes. All Socialism right. arose as an attempt to merge Thank you. <laughs> the best parts of capitalism with the best parts. Right. Socialism was trying to do both, right? What well, works. Yeah. So then if we go back to the slide we were looking at, we see the Democrats moving toward democratic socialism, right? And being called socialists and sometimes communists and being called Marxists when he had nothing to do with what they're talking about. So then the next piece is what appears to be going on with the Republicans. Noam Chomsky, one of my favorite linguists, I mean, this goes back to Richard Nixon, actually, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, Nixon, who was intelligent state. You're fine. Keep going. I understood that the Republicans, who are more oriented than the Democrats towards corporate power and private wealth, uh, cannot win elections on their own programs. You can't approach the electorate and saying, I want to stab you in the back, enrich the rich, and empower the corporate sector. It doesn't work. So they had to turn to other issues, what are called cultural issues. Uh, Nixon began it with what was called the Southern Strategy. Uh, Democrats had been supporting Johnson's uh, civil rights acts that caused great resentment among the deeply racist uh, Southern Democrats. Uh, Nixon recognized that by hinting, you didn't have to say it in words, but by hinting that the Republicans would become the white supremacist party, he could win over the Southern Democrats. That was the Southern strategy. Worked pretty well. Uh, then they moved to other issues by the mid-70s, Republican strategists recognized that if they pretended, I stress pretended, to be opposed to abortion, they could win the huge evangelical vote, 25% of the population, Northern Catholics. So they all switched on a dime. Uh, Reagan, George H.W. Bush had always been what we call pro-choice, but all of a sudden they became passionately anti-abortion, uh, next to uh, guns, next to other things. Trump uh, was extreme. He carried this. This is after the commentary that I mentioned on the radical insurgency. But Trump, quite brilliantly, was able to tap the poisons that run right below the surface in American society. There, there might be. Professor, speaking of this idea of an insurrection uh, and, and Trump, I mean, we had an actual attack on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021, which you described as an attempted coup. Uh, some have said that the United States is still witnessing a slow motion insurrection by Republicans and that they're using uh, election theft or they're at least plotting election theft. According to the state's United Democracy Center last year, at least 262 bills were introduced in 41 states that would interfere with elections. Is our democracy being subverted through the electoral process? And, and what relationship does it have to, to Trump and this right-wing insurgency that you're talking about? Well, Trump has managed to mobilize a popular cult of uh, worshipful followers. Uh, uh, anything he does, they support. And they've basically taken over the Republican Party, or what used to be the Republican Party. Uh, Republican leaders are groveling at his feet, afraid to offend him in any way. Uh, Trump has made it very clear, more clear in the last few days, that he does not believe that the United States should have a functioning democracy. He's said explicitly that the Vice President, Mike Pence, could have overturned the election and failed to do it. It was Pence's failure, his fault, that the election was not overturned uh, and handed over to Trump. He said it quite explicitly. 
uh, there's no uh, effort in Congress to, the Constitution happens to be rather vague about this. Uh, nobody in the last 250 years really thought about the possibility that one of the, the political party could arise which wants to overthrow the democratic system. So the laws are a little bit obscure. And there is there are debates going on right now in Congress as to whether to sharpen the rules to make it clearer that the voters uh, should be in charge, not uh, elect, not officials who want to overturn the vote. Trump's against it. And it's not clear how the Republican Party will act on this, but you're correct. There are hundreds of bills in state legislatures, Republican ones, working on various ways to ensure that they can become a permanent uh, dominant minority party. So Noam Chomsky has been, is a linguist who, through the study of language, has helped to explain much of what's gone on in the history of this country. He's observed much of it, obviously, since the 60s. All right. So I want to explain what fascism is. We've talked about what socialism is. We need to look at what fascism is. And that's what this next YouTube does. We forget that many fascist regimes started off as democratic political parties. We forget that Hitler, the Nazi party, ran in an election. Fascist parties start as fascist social and political movements before they come to power. So it's important to see that these tactics occur even in societies that do not have a fascist regime. All nationalism involves a mythic past. So you can say, look, we're Polish people, people who spoke Polish and were sheep herders and another bunch of Polish people who were fishermen. You can talk about how things were wonderful when we were all Polish together. That's a fine mythic past. But then there's the fascist mythic past. In the past, we were great. Wherein did our greatness consist? In our military. And in the past, the dominant racial group ruled over others. And then the fascist leader says, that has been taken from you by the leftists and communists. They want to weaken our military. They want to weaken our greatness. Propaganda is ubiquitous and everyone uses propaganda. In political propaganda, your main message is something other than the information you're conveying. Fascist propaganda is a very particular structure. It's based around a friend-enemy distinction. The political opponent, they are a merciless threat to your very existence and your traditions. They are the other. When they are in charge, it subverts the nation. So the structure, fascist propaganda, is based on the idea that the other are fundamentally opposed to the nation. As Hitler says in Mein Kampf, science is only useful insofar as it strengthens the nation. Fascism is, is a cult of the leader. It involves the leader setting the rules about what's true and false. So any kind of expertise, reality, all of that is a challenge to the authority of the leader. If science would help him, then he can say, okay, I'll use it. Institutions that teach multiple perspectives on history in all its complexity are always a threat to the fascist leader. The center of democracy is truth. You're not free if you've been lied to. Nobody thinks the people of North Korea are free. The people of North Korea will vote for dear leader every time because they've been lied to. It's not a free vote because they don't have access to the truth. Equality similarly requires truth because equality in democracy doesn't mean we all have the same amount of money. It doesn't mean we all have the same car. It means political equality that each of our voices matters the same. And political equality means speaking truth to power. If someone really powerful is humiliated when they're caught lying, that's the core of political equality. So if you're gonna rip the heart out of democracy, you get people used to lies. Here's a fact about humans. We all pretty much suck to the same degree. <laughs> One group of us is not better than another group of us. Hierarchy is central here. 
because it's the big lie at the center of things. What is racism but one big lie? Racism is the lie that one group is better than another. You're told this religion is better, this race is better, this gender is better. It's really a moral claim, has more moral worth. And then once you have hierarchy set up, you can make people very nervous and frightened about losing their position on that hierarchy. Hierarchy goes right into victimhood because once you convince people that they are justifiably higher on the hierarchy, then you can tell them that they're victims of equality. German Christians are victims of Jews. White Americans are victims of black American equality. Men are victims of feminism. Once you convince people that they should be better, that they have earned a position on the hierarchy over others, then you can tell them that equality is actually victim. Loyalty to the dominant group means law-abidingness, and the minority group is by its nature not law-abiding. Law and order in fascist politics means the members of the minority group who accept their subservient role, they're law-abiding, and the members of the dominant group by their very nature are law-abiding. By definition, the leader can't violate law and order. So law and order doesn't mean justice. Law and order doesn't mean equality. Law and order structures who's legitimate and who's not. Everywhere around the world, no matter what the situation is, in very different socioeconomic conditions, the fascist leader comes and tells you, your women and children are under threat. You need a strong man to protect your families. They make conservatives hysterically afraid of transgender <laughs> rights or homosexuality, other ways of living. These are not people trying to live their own lives. Well, keep going. Huh. I have it on my phone, but it doesn't have any sound. It did, and then it went out. I was going to go sit down in the living room. They're trying to destroy your life, and they're coming after your children. What the fascist politician does is they take conservatives who aren't fascist at all, and they say, look, I know you might not like my ways. You might think I'm a womanizer. You might think I'm violent in my rhetoric. But you need someone like me now. You need someone like me because homosexuality, it isn't just trying for equality. It's coming after your family. Fascist movements typically, though not invariably, rest on an urban-rural divide. The cities are where there's decadence, where the elites congregate, where there's immigrants, there's criminality, there's Sodom and Gomorrah. In the city, there's not real work. The pure, hardworking, real members of the nation live in the rural areas, where they work hard with their hands. When our politicians talk about inner city voters or urban voters, we all know what they mean. Arbeit macht frei, work shall make you free. This was written on the gates of Auschwitz. The idea is that the minority group, they're lazy and they need to be made to work. Free labor. The minority group and the leftists, they're lazy by their nature and it gives them a work ethic. Labor unions are run by communists who are trying to make things easier. Hard work is a virtue. In liberal democracy, we don't value people by how hard they work. What would happen to disabled people who can't work? They would then have no value. It's why the Nazis had the T4 program to murder the disabled, because the disabled were lebens unwertiges Leben, life unworthy of life, because to be valued was to be capable of hard work. Each of these individual elements is not in and of itself fascist, but you have to worry when they're all grouped together. When honest conservatives are lured into fascism by people who tell them, look, it's an existential fight. I know you don't accept everything we do, you don't accept every doctrine, but your family is under threat. And we have seen far too much of that in the last few years. So that gets us to the next slide. What has been happening is in the 90s, 
prior to Newt Gingrich in the Congress, we had pretty much, yeah, the same group of people thinking pretty much the same way with some minor modifications. And by 2004, that had begun to split. And in 2017, this is what we're talking about. And you can imagine what it's like five years later. There is virtually no overlap between what the Republican Party rhetoric is saying and what the Democratic traditions have been, the Democrat Party, Democratic Party traditions have been. And the folks in the middle are smaller and smaller because we're more and more uncomfortable with both sides, right? All right. So how did we get so divided? Next slide. It's a whole lot of things, lots and lots of things. The micro drivers. This is, um, yeah, this is from an article called, Is the U.S. Heading Toward a Second Civil War, by the way? So the micro drivers are, the, are little things, right? Um, I'm just going to pick a couple. Uh, increasing distrust in major institutions, uh, the crisis of meaning as families and communities are fractured, spread of economic rationality, the means justifies the ends, um, increasing information overload, etc. All of these things are you know, just little things that are contributing to it. Then we have the macro drivers. And we've been talking about a couple of them, you know, that two-party winner-takes-all system, our 400-year legacy of white supremacy, and the issues that are happening in government, the gridlock that we're in right now, the kind of campaigning that we've learned about must happen if someone's going to get on that primary ballot or you know, nominated from it. Um, and so on, rising inequality, destabilization from political shocks, and this has been going on since the 60s. And then right in the middle, Newt Gingrich's restructuring of Congress's social fabric. I don't very often do name calling. I very rarely blame anyone. This man has single-handedly destroyed the American political system. Okay? He came into Congress with the avowed intention of making it so the Democrats would never control Congress again. And he's the one who impeached Bill Clinton for doing something that virtually every president has done since the beginning. Um, he created a climate that we saw first most obviously when Obama was elected and the Republican Congress said, we will block anything he tries to do. We will not pass it, period. That was the first time we saw it. But it had been building for the decade prior to it. It turns out that although he is no longer officially in any political position, Newt Gingrich is in charge of the training of Republican candidates. And if you go to the Republican candidate site, you will see a list of words. Two lists of words. One list of words is how you may describe any Republican, and the other is how you must describe any other party member, any other candidate. And they are horribly in contrast with each other. Um, Newt Gingrich runs a, an international consulting firm where he takes this process of training people to become populist candidates. Hmm to other countries. Hmm. So this is what we are seeing. I know the guy wishes he, you know, thinks in the same way, frankly, Adolf Hitler thought that he's making the world a better world doing this. But in the same sad way, he has virtually destroyed everything that has made America what it is. So, He's in the middle of this list of macro drivers, but if you, you can trace almost from 1994, the rise of radical rights within the Republican Party and the shift of the party from 
centrist to increasingly fascist in its policies and behaviors, right? We see the manipulation of fear, and that's not just by political leaders. That's this 24-hour news system that is built on dramatically, and it says down on there, increasing perceptions of threats. A friend of mine says, he absolutely swears to this, that he heard a news anchor off mic, not knowing that he had a hot mic, saying, it's getting harder and harder to fill an hour with bad news. I take several news services on, on my internet. I worked as a futurist, and so I try to monitor what's going on. And um, I've noticed something. I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the inner city of Chicago. I watched gunfights in the street below my apartment window. And when by the time I was a teenager, when I walked home from my piano lesson, the local cop, beat cop, walked on the other side of the street to make sure I'd be home safe. Okay? We moved. <laughs> We moved to a totally different world. But that's the world I grew up in. That's a violent world. I was in my neighborhood. No, it, this stuff wasn't even in the newspapers, in the local paper. Nobody reported this stuff, right? If a kid got lost, the kid got lost. You'd find him, right? I don't know if you track any of the national news on the internet. <laughs> uh, Right before the first time we did this class, the, one of the headlines was three-year-old found after being gone four hours. Really? <laughs> right? And we hear about people in North Carolina, and it wasn't a local person, it was in another state, right? We hear about people in other states having domestic violence issues or about gang battles going on in other states as if it's about us and about our life. Has anyone been to Portland lately? I go to Portland every month. I have classes that I teach there. I only get into the old downtown Portland every two or three months, and it, it's hard to be down there. I used to stand with women in black on the park blocks that are now virtually non-existent. Yeah. It's very hard to be done. But that's the only part of Portland that's been affected by all that mess. The rest of the city is fine. Why do we pretend? Why do we make this you know, idea of threat? Well, that fascist thing, right? It's moving the nation toward preparedness that we need what Donald Trump promised to the people who had bought all of this, a strong, capable man to come in and fix it. He came in from the outside and he knew how to do it. I have Trump, Trump Republicans in my family and I would say, okay, so tell me, you know, what is it? What, you know, I, I need to know. I haven't made up a mind mind what I'm doing yet. Tell me what I need to know. And invariably it was a fresh voice outside of the system who knew he was a great businessman and you know and he would be able to fix things well obviously my, my that part of my family doesn't understand that if you live on the borrowing the money you are borrowing and you go bankrupt every three years that's not quite good business anyway so all of that leads to the next slide. Okay, we missed one in there. <laughs> there we go, that one, yes. This, these things have been going on since the 50s, 60s, the baby boomers, and then starting pretty much in the 80s and 90s, certainly by 2011, 9-11, we have the conspiracy theorists. And then we've got that media that's catastrophizing everything. Even the Weather Channel catastrophizes things, right? Teaching us the violence is everywhere and increasing, and then no one is safe. And then the real distress is watching the government systems fail. All of these things have led us to a decline of trust. Now, the fact that they are failing is only partially because of the things we've been talking about. There's other things going on here, but we can do the Ben Franklin quote. The next slide. 
Shall I read it out loud? There are two passions which have a powerful influence on the affairs of men. These are ambition and avarice. The love of power and the love of money. Place before the eyes of such men a post of honor that shall be at the same time a place of profit, and they will move heaven and earth to obtain it. While there have been a few millionaires elected to Congress, there are very few people who leave Congress without being millionaires. While there have been a few millionaires elected to the presidency, since Harry Truman, nobody has left the presidency broke. <laughs> Something to think about. All right, thank you. Which brings us to how it is that white nationalism or Christian white Christian nationalism has become what it has become. So the first thing is we learned a lot about what fascism is, and there's pieces of it there. The nation first and best and always. The nation defined as the people who have always been in control, always in quotes, the light-skinned people, the, a particular group of moral people, in this case born-again Christians, who are against federal regulation, which is the mark of the old Republican Party, and additionally are against international cooperation. And international cooperation has never been part of the official Republican Party you know, platform. It's been officially the Democratic Party platform. But if you look at who votes for what, guess what? Anyway, ultimately though, the Christian white nationalists are trying to take over the government, partly because of what Newt Gingrich did and partly because of this pressure toward this definition of what it means to be American that we've been learning about as we've gone forward. This is a journalist. So today I'm here to tell you what we often think of as the religious right doesn't exist in the same way as we often think about it. Uh, many people think of it as a culture war, uh, preoccupied with things like abortion and same-sex marriage, but that framework is inadequate to understanding the challenges that we're facing. Christian nationalism makes use of religion, but it's not just trying to achieve religious, social, or cultural aims. It's really trying to achieve political power, and it is an anti-democratic movement because it says that the foundation of legitimate government in the United States is a strict interpretation of a particular religion. The consensus is still in some quarters to view the religious right through that culture war frame. The point of my book, The Good News Club, I'm sorry, The Power Worshippers, is that that framework is not adequate. The movement has changed. It's not a social conservative movement. Um, it's really, you know, it, the right points of comparison, allowing for some differences of detail, of course, are the religious nationalist movements in countries like Hungary, Turkey, and Russia. When leaders of those countries bind themselves tightly to religious conservative figures to consolidate an authoritarian form of political power, we rightly recognize that as a form of religious nationalism. And that's what we're seeing today with Trump and his alliances with hyper-conservative religious leaders. I also think it's helpful in understanding the movement to distinguish between the leaders and the rank and file. When we're talking about the rank and file, we are talking about a very wide range of people with very different interests, backgrounds, and ideas. A very substantial number of the movement's supporters would be unhappy to learn all of the details of what their leaders are proposing. A lot of them are really voting identity and not just policy. When they vote for the candidate who promises to end abortion, for instance, they aren't explicitly aiming for major fundamental changes in the way American government is organized. They're really making a statement about who they are and what they value in themselves. But for the leaders of the movement, which are the heads of the religious right policy groups, the networking groups, the media and legislative initiatives, the legal um, organizations, the data initiatives and the like, these are sort of different components of the machinery of the movement, their vision, like the leadership of, of, of that machinery, involves a lot more power for themselves and their networks. And for the political leaders that they support, many are looking forward to a time when only 
what they call Christians in their approved versions of the religion. They have very specific ideas about what forms of Christianity are acceptable. So they're looking for a time when their sort of their people, right, are in charge of all major areas of government and society. They're also looking forward to a time when they can rely on government for two things, which is a constant flow of taxpayer money and also policies that privilege members of their uh, conservative interpretation of the Christian religion. Not just Christian evangelists in the rural areas. How many of you have driven around Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, yeah? Uh, do you ever turn on the radio when you're driving? <laughs> yeah, I have family, and then I, I've driven across that part of the country many times, and um, I do listen to the radio when I am. If I'm within 15 miles of the university, I can get something other than conservative Christian radio stations if I'm within 15 miles of a university. Yeah. All right. So we have three categories, four categories here. The white line is the people who reject white Christian nationalism. The blue are the ones who are resisting it. The gray is the one who are accommodating it. And the red are the folks who are promoting it, the ambassadors. So among races, African Americans are actually accommodating white Christian nationalism out of a fear of what they've been told socialism will do to them. All right. But we've also got Hispanics promoting it. All right. And part of that is it's been tied to business is going to be better. Okay. The red stuff is all promotion, the blue is resisting. All right. And what was fascinating to me, of course, is the Jewish group is the largest number of rejectors and the, quote, no affiliation, which means most of Oregon, 89% of Oregon being no affiliation, um, are also rejecting white Christian nationalism. However, a lot of folks in a lot of traditions are supporting these things. Something that's a little scary. It's not just a bunch of rural white evangelists. It's people from all walks of life, of all religious traditions. So this is a sort of, these are some of the signs on January 6th. This is what people were carrying in their peaceful demonstration on January 6th. So we're looking at how do we get here? We've been saying a lot of specifics. There's some general tendencies over the last few years and a huge amount is this notion that there is an enemy out there and we have to be fighting the enemy and we just change what the enemy is till now the enemy is seen as internal it's a threat internal it's not out there and the next slide so the other piece the longer piece, and this is one of the things I was saying, addressing earlier when I said the breakdown of the institutions isn't just about how Congress is not functioning. Empire cultures tend to move in consistent directions with consistent patterns. And so if we think about, you know, at what that video that we heard about anarchy and democ democracies and all of that, Ultimately, an anarchy leads to someone coming up and saying, I'm, I'm in charge, I'll fix it, right? And often, a democracy turns into a few people saying, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of everything, we'll manage it, we'll be in charge, you'll be fine. And then out of that arises one who becomes the dictator. And then the oligarchy often turns into this other thing called fascism that we've been talking about ultimately leading to a dictator. As long as people are caught up in this set of values having to do with acquire, accumulate, and control, and have these values that say some people are better than others, and all the things that he laid out in those 10 points of the fascist way of being, we're going to move in that direction. So those processes are ongoing in all human empire structure systems. 
but we don't have to be stuck in an empire culture system. There we go. If we look at some of the historians, Toynbee was my primary teacher in my 20s of this stuff. He pointed out that civilizations, cultures, empires evolve consistently. They evolve through challenges from their environment by, as they resolve the challenges. And usually those challenges are evolved by a creative minority. I'm thinking right the, now about the moon challenge when Kennedy challenged us to get onto the moon in less than a decade, right? A creative minority emerged to develop the capability to do that. She'll find it. <laughs> it's the longer view culture dynamics. It's like, how did the current mishap in culture dynamics? So, it, yeah, one of the interesting things about that was when Congress didn't see the value in a space race anymore and didn't have a champion, all those aerospace engineers needed jobs. And they went into policy planning, urban planning, community planning, and all kinds of design and planning situations that we have been experiencing the results of. I know this personally because I had a number of people during the 70s who, in my world who did that. They transitioned from aerospace engineering to urban planning because they could bring those tools to work there. So then ultimately there becomes this process, as Toynbee says, the universality or universally the same state. That is where everyone has to be alike. And that's when you lead to moral decay, the final decay. One of the things that Cicero said about Rome as it was be transitioning from the Republic was that there was this demand for everyone to be alike. And so what happened during that period is all the ancient lineages of patricians who knew better moved out to the countryside. So what was going on in Rome and therefore in the empire was now being monitored and, and managed by people who didn't have that uh, unique idiosyncratic way of thinking that had been the norm for the leadership of Rome up to that time. Whoops, same. Stay there, please. Alastair Taylor is my second teacher. He was um, an amazing author and writer on, on social dynamics and cultural dynamics. And there is a book that came out in the late 60s, early 70s called Ev Evolution and Consciousness. It was edited by a Berkeley um, management scientist, Eric Yanch, a psychologist, and a British biologist, C.H. Waddington. Yanch and Waddington wrote Evolution and Consciousness. Alastair Taylor added this article in where he talked about the importance of the feedback loops from the effects on the environment around the empire culture system, affecting the dynamics internally within it. And as the world around fell apart, as it must, because empire is constantly sucking everything in, so the world out there is going to fall apart, then that ultimately leads to the decay of the center. And so that's Taylor's dynamic there. Marnie is another one who suggested systems processes, and he actually has a book out on this subject, System Processes and Cultural Dissolution. And M Mark Markley has another one. So we're going to go on to the next slide, I think. No, next one. <laughs> All right, and this is this is from the the book that came out as Changing Images of Man in 1984, and it was originally written in 1974 as a report uh, from Stanford Research Institute, and I was kind of on the edges of it. And the idea here is a classic futurist idea. What we are seeing is a separation between what people expect to see happen and what is actually happening. And so the dotted line is the image of what people think is going to be happening. And the solid line is the behavior patterns that are associated with that particular cultural group. 
when those behavior patterns get too far from the image, things fall apart. And that creative minority that Toynbee talks about emerge and they begin the behavior patterns to come in closer to the image. But also the image shifts toward the behavior patterns. And that's what we've been seeing as we have been seeing a change in the image of what it means to be American now. The image is shifting. The behavior patterns are pulling and the, be, you know, the image away from the original images and the, dumb, the, the creative minority, in this case, nationalists, Christian nationalists, are pulling the behavior toward this revised image. So this is the ongoing dynamic of any culture anywhere, human culture, and it can be a family. It can be your own inner culture, but this is some of the things that we are dealing with. Okay, next. So, given all of that, this is where we are. This is how we got here. It's not fun. It's not pretty. It's scary. Where are we headed? This is the table that relates various different theories about how different species, different systems, different kinds of systems go through effectively the same stages. We just call them different things. Okay? So you can talk about them as properties. You can talk about them as systems and ecology, which is one of my deep loves. You can talk about them as information theory. You can talk about them as economics. You can talk about it as physiology. The one in the middle is us <laughs> as a culture, right? So we have growth. And then as the system breaks apart, we have collapse. And then we have a sense of emptiness. And then we have growth. And then if the system remains in the same type of system, we will have collapse again. Now, has anyone ever studied the history of empire cultures in our world? <laughs> the civilizations that they grow and they collapse, and they grow and they collapse. And typically, one empire will take over another one in that collapse stage so that you can, you know, you can trace the Sumerians and the Akkadians and the Hittites and you know, all, the, all the way up to the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans taking over the Greeks and so on. So it's basically looking like one, one begins to collapse and the other one comes in and the next one collapses and the next, you know, that kind of thing. And that's how we got to where we are now. Next slide, please. So republics become oligarchies when there is a ruling elite. And even if your empire is a republic, you have a ruling elite. Basically the same thousand or you know one percent, remember the one percent? They run the show. <laughs> Basically, that's the case in any in any empire culture. All right. So in our situation, we have the ruling elite, elite at every level of government. Then the federation that we are became an empire as there became more and more federal funding of local projects. And federal funding implies federal control. So for example, I'll go back to education. Does anyone remember Title I? Great. First time the feds ever funded local education was Title I. And it had certain rules. If you were going to use the money, you had to use it in certain ways. I think we're at Title 14 now. Yeah, and each one of them has its rules. You have to use it a certain way. That first one that people in this room remember happened because of the National Defense Education Act, which was an attempt to catch up to where we thought the Russians were because they got Sputnik in space before we did. Okay, so it was defense. It was the beginning of the Federation becoming an empire by controlling local activities through funding. All right? And then the other piece really came into place. It was, it was emerging the whole time as soon as Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine began to be part of our culture, 
But if you go to the Spanish-American War, we ended up with military bases on places that are not part of the U.S. And we still have an island called Puerto Rico that we tax, but we don't give representation to. I am quite figured that one out. Um, but we support trade internationally with our military, just like, oh, let's see, the India Corporation, British West East Indies Corporation, yeah? Hmm, I wonder. It's the same kind of system. It just isn't being called an empire. Now, corporations become part of that, as I just named one of them in the British Empire, but they do when they are too big or essential. Oh, too big to fail. Have I heard that? Yeah, exactly. And they pay for the electoral process, right? And the Supreme Court a while back declared that a corporation could be counted as a citizen. This is how corporations become part of the government, which is one of the definitions of fascism. Another piece of what goes on is what is acceptable in the corporation is now acceptable in the culture. Corporate norms become social norms. And it used to be social norms were applied on the business, you know, applied to a business. But now what the corporations say is appropriate is being considered appropriate for everyone else in the country. Whether, we, you know, whether it has to do with how we dress, what we eat, what our hours are, whether we have to get up an hour earlier in November 6th or not, um, those kinds of things. <laughs> and then finally, we have this whole thing of wage structures in the businesses, which set classes in the country. I don't have time to go into it now, but I have a different model of American classes than a wage structure because I've always been an academic and a minister, and we don't make much money. But in my inner city neighborhoods that I've lived in, they always thought I was the rich one, right? Even though they were typically making a, making a lot more than I was, sometimes two or three times as much as I was. So our classes are not the same as our income levels. Yeah? All right, next slide, please. So what's been happening is these things, all these strands come together, is we've actually lived out a model that was published in 1973 that everyone said, no, 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 not possible. Well, I got to play with that model when I was a grad student, and I couldn't make it come out any different, really. I could move it, fudge it 15 years one way or another, but changing the, the variables, changing the, the uh, mechanisms that we used to change you know, within the model, etc. So this is the limits to growth world model, and it's based on a piece of software that is called Dynamo, but you can buy today as Stella, S-T-E-L-L-A. -L -L and basically it's saying, Given the numbers that were in place at that time with the world, what the population was, what the resource base was, what food production was, etc., these rates and levels were going through this process from about 1900 to about 2100. And you can see 2150. Well, the, that's as far out as I could ever push it, was 2150, where everything was pretty much bottomed out. The black line is the death rate, the birth rate goes right up with it, but they're not increasing the population any. The population is going way down. So this oval, this dashed oval in the middle, is where we are. And that's what we are seeing around us as resources are less available, as illnesses are on the increase, as Pollution has its impact on both our personal well-being and on the well-being of the planet. It may be heat pollution. All those other things have brought us to this point where right now everything is plunging. It doesn't feel good at all. In the 70s, 
we saw it as I was an active futurist when this book came out. We told the world, these are the things you can do. And nobody did them. Nobody wanted to believe. And that's partly because we tend to discount the future. We tend to say, oh, no, it's not going to happen here. And it's also because there, it's also contributed to, and it's this interesting feedback loop. On the one hand, I want to believe what the book of Revelation tells me, that God's going to take care of everything, and it's all going to fall apart, but we're all going to be fine. On the other hand, if I do anything different, then I'm going to, you know, cause that not to happen and you know we get this weird cycle of thinking going so we actually have a large number on the order of 25 percent of the u.s population of people who believe we can't do anything because then we will stop the book of revelation from coming to pass all right so that's a big part of why the things that could have been done weren't done Next slide, please. Another way to look at this, we're still in the red oval, is thinking it in terms of the qualities of life. Okay? The black line here is fears. The next line is being creative and addressing those fears. Those things will continue to grow during this time. Comfort will be harder to come by, but it's not gone. <laughs> And food and resources will be much, much, much more limited than we're accustomed to. And the control systems will be going away. The systems of police and military, the systems of government telling you how you can teach your kids, the systems of all these things that are going away will continue to go away as we enter into this time. But this is not necessarily a disturbing thing. Yes, the death rate is up. We have 8 billion people on the planet. I don't know that we really want to have a continuing growth in population. And in fact, there is a book called The Empty Planet that says it's already turned around. And you know why it's turned around? Because women all over the world are carrying these and have smartphones, not just phones, smartphones, and they all have access to the internet, which means every woman, slum women in India, farmers women in Ghana, wherever they are, they have access to the information that they need so that even though, as the slum women in India have been known to say, even though my husband is family is pressuring me, I'm only going to have two kids. Yes. It's begun. Next system. Next slide, please. So the really long view, I like to say I, I tend to think from 4,000 BC to 3,080. <laughs> that's, that's my life range. <laughs> right? So back around 4,000 BC, we have this environmental pressure and technological innovation that led to agriculture, that led to the former formation of city-states, that led to Sargon declaring himself the empire over a bunch of cities, okay? All of that. And so we have that little wiggly line down the very bottom that's hunting, gathering tribes. They've always been barely the population, not hardly anybody. And then we have a bluish line above it that's called garden villages okay about 10,000 bc people started more and more staying in one spot in an egalitarian social structure where the women tended to be in charge of land and home and the kinds of things that could be gathered and you know, harvested and men tended to be in charge of the world out there and tended to hunt and fish and be physically active and you'll see stone circles wherever the men were and you'll see underground wombs wherever the women were over and over again the temples that we know the churches that we know they're all built to model to model they are modeling those same structures and all that's in my book madonna magdalene and beyond so garden villages were doing just fine but remember i talked about those guys coming out of the caucasus 
those guys were herders. They had descended from the glacier hunters of huge Pleistocene mammals. And then as the glaciers retreated, there weren't huge Pleistocene mammals. They, and there were cattle, and there were horses, and there were sheep, and there were goats. So they began to, instead of follow the herds, they began to manage the herds that they could keep alive. And so they became herders. And I call them the first cowboys. So the first cowboys come rolling out of the Caucasus, driving their cattle across the gardens, thinking, that's useless. I need rangeland. <laughs> right? So basically, they destroyed villages right and left. And the other piece of it is that they had this notion, because they were herders and because they had grown up hunting these great big things and spending long winter nights telling stories about how wonderfully and heroic these guys had been out collecting and, 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 and hunting these marvelous beasts, oh, they had a very different value system from the relatively egalitarian, balanced gardeners, <laughs> right? So they would come in and they'd take what they want. And the first time that we see in a documentation of this is in the ancient tale, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's an exact description of how this worked. All right, so 4000 BC, that's what we see. So we begin to see the rise of the green line there. And the green line is the medieval fiefdom. It was, you know, that empire that was basically a few hundred miles, maybe a thousand at most. And it was, you know, lots of layers of people owning, accumulating, controlling, all of that, right? Then about a thousand CE, this is fascinating to me, a bunch of monks began to do things that look an awful lot like factories. <laughs> and they also did an interesting thing. Once you became part of the monastery, it didn't matter whether you were a prince or a pauper before, now you were a brother. And in the monastery, there, yes, there was the hierarchy of the order, but within the monastery, there were elected leaders. And everyone had a vote a vote. So in the Cistercian, particularly the Cistercians, and the people who followed the St. Benedict's rule, we find the beginning of this whole concept that is the Republican <laughs> democratic structure in which machines are the way that we can make things happen. There's a wonderful book called The Medieval Machine. I forgot the author, but it's a good one if you want to follow up on that. So that happened about 1000 CE and spread through Europe and through Asia and became the basis for what I'm, we were calling democratic republics. So by the 1800s, when, you know, 1770s, when our guys are doing their thinking, these ideas have been out there for a while in the monasteries, in the Freemasons who were developed from that, in the Rosicrucians that were developed from that same group, and virtually all of our founders were Freemasons. So that becomes the Democratic Republic, but the Democratic Republic has done this thing of becoming an empire and an oligarchy, and it's beginning to fall apart, the dotted line going downward. That solid line there is where we are today. And what happened about 2000 CE, and actually I'm going to say 1960s CE, but you know I'm being more general in this table. 1960s, we have the emergence of ecology, the emergence of systems thinking, the emergence of cybernetics. These are my fields of interest. Anthropology was my base, and these other things are what I studied most. And these ideas became the basis for a whole new relationship with the planet, a whole new relationship with each other. In 1965, UUs were formed with our seven principles, our six principles. And in 1985, we added the seventh, the interconnected web of life. And all of that was the beginning of a whole new culture, this last little green line. This culture has been emerging on the planet since about 1965. 
And what's really interesting about cultural emergence is it takes three generations. The structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn, takes 75 years typically for an idea that makes sense and that fits and that is clearly the next step to become the norm. Now, think about it. Most of you were in high school before the 70s, and I bet you didn't hear much about Einstein's theory of relativity when you were in class before in high school. It's in every high school class now. Not just in physics, it's in the general science class, that freshman introductory class. Quantum theory is part of it. Well, guess what? All of that came out. He published in 1906. It wasn't 75 years. <laughs> That's why we didn't get it. So this concept of 75 years gives me great hope. 1965 to 1925 is, I mean, 2025, it's only 60 years. We are in the middle of the emergence of this thing, this new way of culture. Next slide, please. And this new way of culture is based on our seven principles. Yes! <laughs> All within the framework of the interconnected way of life, web of life, and the theology of Unitarianism, which I know many Unitarians do not consider yourself theists, and I get that. But frankly, all of my study of consciousness, which is the other place that I love to be, consciousness and metaphysics, says there is one intelligence that is throughout all that is. The physics tells me this, and you can call it whatever you want to call it, but there is one an eternal field of intelligence. And we can call it loving because it is for the benefit. It works always for the benefit of the whole and the individuals within the whole. All I, mean, I do a radio show called Noetic Moments. It's on kxcr.net. And Noetic Moments is the science of consciousness. And every time I bring in someone new, I get more reinforcement for this idea. But the other piece of what Unitarians are about, Unitarians, Unitarians, right, is one people on one planet. We are all one. It's not a trinity, it, you know, et cetera. So that, to me, is the essence of what this culture is that is emerging. And it turns out that if you were to really analyze and assess the values of indigenous cultures all over the world, that's what you would find over and over again. This other is simply an example of how it could be implemented, particularly with regard to books, right? So if we talk about equality, right, we're talking about everybody gets the same thing. That was what the guy talked about when he said communism, everyone gets the same thing, everyone has to have exactly the same, all right? Diversity says everyone can have a different kind. And diversity is a mature concept. There was a series of studies done in the 40s and repeated in the 60s and again in the 80s, they're called the Harvard studies, where if you take a freshman, you know, a high school graduate, a high school graduate is going to be pretty much dualist. There's good guys and there's bad guys, and I'm the good guy, right? And then you put him in a liberal arts education. Okay, this is not your, class, your current notion of a degree, but in the traditional liberal arts where you're getting, you know, a little philosophy and anthropology and history and literature and some science of this kind and some science of that kind and whatever, you're getting all of that. And um, during the freshman year, the freshman encounters for the first time in his life multiple authorities who are all right. At the end of the freshman year, he's going, there's nobody out there that's got the answer. <laughs> you just you get that freshman confusion, okay? The sophomore year, they're beginning to choose. You know, they're getting a sense of, okay, yeah, you know, these guys, they got the answer. I don't like these guys. So at the end of the sophomore year, you start getting a dualistic thing being reinforced. How many people in our culture today are getting a two-year college degree? 
or the only thing they get outside of their professional degree is the two-year general ed curriculum that I helped design at one university. Yeah. So what we've done is we've created for 40 years committed dualists. They're not getting the third and fourth years of the liberal arts education during which they are discovering after they've had the opportunity to really explore the possibilities and exchange with each other. Ah, wow, you're still a good person and you think differently from me. Oh my goodness, look at that. And ultimately what emerges is what we call a committed relativist. Someone who says it's okay for you to be who you are in the way you are. And it's okay to be me in the way I am. There is that awful period during the junior year where you go, it's all relative. We've all been there. We were in the 60s. It's all relative. <laughs> right? But then there's that place you get to of, this is my path. That's their path. This works for me. Committed relativism allows for and encourages diversity and equity, and acceptance, and ultimately allows for a sense of belonging in spite of differences. And then when it is not present, in some cases encourages, encourages us to fight for the rights for folks to be able to have what is appropriate to them. Yes. All right, next slide, please. So where we are headed, the dissolution of the empire culture of the last 6,000 years. Humanity's been on the planet, the genus for over 2 million years, the species Homo sapiens for close to 100,000 years, and only six of them have we been doing this ridiculous empire stuff. Now it's got us to an incredible place. I mean, we can be having this meeting and having people who aren't in the same room with us be part of it, right? There's amazing things that we got out of this. And I love it. But that doesn't mean I want to continue to live in a way that some people are oppressed so that a few people can have everything they want whenever they want it. Or that I want to live on a planet that is constantly being destroyed because we are accumulating, acquiring, accumulating, and controlling, and we call nature our enemy that we have to control. So the other piece of it then is the emergence of this sustaining culture based on these principles in local economic and social systems. That's what we're going to see more and more. Globalization, the national economists, the international economists are finally saying, oh, that globalization process is over. We're not doing that anymore. That doesn't mean we're not going to continue to be connected and trade with people in other cultures and other lands. We will, but not by having one particular way of doing things imposed on everyone out there. Yeah? And that leads, and this is part of what's written about in my book called Home, to a global coordination of transportation and communication, which is all you need at the global level. That's it. You don't need anyone doing anything else. If at the regional level, within watersheds, within bioregions, we actually know how to function, which is the other part of my book, Home. Now, I have spent my whole life as an adult, my whole adult life, working to minimize the violence of this transition. <laughs> so I, I haven't done very well because we've had to go through a lot of violence. On the other hand, in the 60s, we thought it would take a nuclear war to get here. In the 70s, we thought it would take total disruption of the world energy and political systems to get to where we are now, much less where we are going. It's not that bad. It's not good. It's not the easy transition it could have been if we'd put a lot of things in place in the 70s and 80s. But compared to what it could have been, this is not going to be so bad. The world that we know 
naturally, the natural world that we know will continue to thrive. The cultural war that, world <laughs> that we know will no longer have war in it because we will have done the inner work that will have removed the conflict and the tendency to conflict in each and every one of us as we live these UU principles. Now, what do I mean by that? Has anyone here of Rupert Sheldrake and morphogenic fields? Okay. I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and the next one. All right. What we do internally is part of a global pattern, okay? I'm a vibrating being. I, my nerves are constantly sending out electromagnetic signals, right? My lungs, my heart, my brain. There's a field around me. And some of you, because you're in this room, resonate with the field that I am. And there are people on the other side of the planet I've never met who also resonate with the field that I am. Then quantum entanglement is part of it. So the field that I am, as I shift, makes it possible for more and more people like me, who resonate with me, to shift. The probability of a change is increased in the whole based on the change in the individual. Okay? So here are five key levers coming from a book that you can't see because the things across it. Peter Coleman wrote this book. Uh, he calls it the way out. He's talking about the way out of what we're in. All right. Commit to a significant reset. Pause sufficiently to be reflective and intentional about the path we choose. Pause every day, every moment, every time we're changing direction, every time we get out of the car, every time we get in the car, every time we change clothes. Pause. What is my intention here? And live from that. Second, spot positive deviance. Find out how to work with what is already working. Where are people being this? What in my world, naturally and socially and culturally, can be supportive of this intention? Three, complicate to simplify. This means stop to really look at what's going on in here, don't just choose what looks easy because there's a lot of stuff going along in here and you need to be in touch with that. So you need to complicate your awareness. Be aware of more and more so that then you can choose with clarity. All right? Move to synchronize. Consider movement as a salve. All right. More and more of the work that I'm finding says that the physical activity that we engage in, even if it's the slightest little bit like, you know, lifting our arms in the morning when we're getting out of bed or whatever, is helping synchronize the whole system, the body brain system, the body mind system. And so as we're moving together inside, we're more likely to move together outside. I know you guys have Kirtan here regularly, and I think you have Dances of Universal Peace here regularly, but that is what Dances of Universal Peace is all about. And if you need to get more of them, I can get Peter over here anytime, or Stephen over here anytime. All right, and then finally, adapt. The way out of our political quagmire will inevitably include pitfalls and failures. <laughs> the key here is to expect and learn from setbacks by taking the long view towards the North Star goal. Ever watch a baby get up and walk the very first time? Nope. <laughs> they start to get up and they fall back. They start to take a step and they fall back. And they keep on doing it until they're walking. And that's how we do it. All right, next one. All right, so what happens then is that as we do this internal shift, we begin to show up as external shifts 
And those external shifts are cultural shifts and political shifts and organizational shifts that are thinking in different ways. There we go. So in order to get to that way of being that as smoothly as possible, okay, it's going to happen. It can't not happen. It's happened over and over again, and it can't not happen this time. All right? The question is, can we do it smoothly? We need to be looking at social structures that are supporting developmental processes. You know, we have classes in churches that encourage people to develop. We want to have community action that is developmental. I'm not going to give you the fish. I'm going to teach you how to fish. Yeah? All right. Technologies that maximize household and community independence. How much of our worry and upset internationally right now is about the grid? The power grid breaking down. We don't want a national or international power grid running our lives. And we don't need it. We have technologies. And we have that again since the 70s. I used to design houses that were that didn't need a furnace. <laughs> Why do you need a furnace? In Oregon, you don't need a furnace. All you need to do is build the house right. In California, you definitely don't need a furnace and you don't need an air conditioner if you build the house right. But we haven't been doing it, right? And the, they're finally, uh, 15 years ago, I was working with a guy, we were trying to get these rotary windmills, you know, people to buy them. We couldn't get anyone to buy one. You know, they wanted to get off the thing, but the reason they wouldn't buy them is because Oregon Energy said, oh no, only the big 80 foot tall windmills work. You can't have a windmill on the coast and generate electricity. I'm going, I got six hours a day of 12 to 80 mile an hour winds every day. You're telling me I can't have wind energy supplying my house? <laughs> and they said, well, if you build an 80 foot tall tower, 50 feet from anywhere else, I'm going, what? <laughs> I got a roof. Right? This is, we need different kinds of technology. There are more and more solar, less and less expensive solar options. There are more and more ways that as we replace things, we can replace them with things that work better and not throw away what we've got. One of my daily, monthly tasks is to collect the local community's e-cycling and get it to an e-cycler they would otherwise be in the trash, right? All right. E-cycling, yes. Electronics. Everything electronic can be redone. It can be taken apart. There is gold in them, their computers. <laughs> but they can also be turned into other computers. Yeah. Decisions that are made in small group dialogue rather than debate. Debate assumes adversary. Actually, I love the word discussion. It comes from the same root as percussion and concussion. <laughs> Dialogue through the word. I listen to you with my heart. You speak from your heart and something wonderful emerges that didn't exist before. Yes! David Bohm on Dialogue. And economics based on community capitalism, Adam Smith's capitalism, rather than corporate capitalism, which is based on greed. As I was driving in today, uh, OPB had a little show on uh, corporate MBAs running companies. Did anyone hear that one? Yeah. Guys that are going to graduate school to get their degree in business are taught that one way you can increase the return to the shareholder, which, by the way, the Security Exchange Committee com Commission says is the number one requirement. And if you don't do it, if you're a publicly traded corporation, you can be fined or closed down, is to maximize the returns on the dividends to the shareholders. That's the reason the company exists. And so you pay the labor less, so you can maximize the shares. What? 
So one of the books I'm working on right now, we're hoping to get it to the publisher in two more weeks, yes, is um, I work with this guy in California. He goes into large companies and he says, I can help you increase your bottom line by creating a corporation in which everyone is being developed in every task every day. And nobody has to take complete and absolute responsibility for anything. And everyone shares from the heart, in dialogue, in authentic community. And that's what we're writing about. Isn't that cool? Community capitalism is the local shoe shop, the local whatever, okay? I, I have helped to form a number of small businesses that provide services to communities that they can't otherwise get because the corporations aren't going to do it. And we do it at a level where everyone gets sufficient and that's all that we care about, right? Do you know the average restaurant owner makes 40000 a year in our country? They're doing it out of luck, not for money. <laughs> but the money is sufficient. As long as the government doesn't keep operating as if a normal income is 125000 a year. Where'd that come from? Anyway, so those things are the shifts in the way we do things culturally and politically, and they're all based on we're a part of an ecosystem. We are part of a natural ecosystem, a political ecosystem, an economic ecosystem, a community ecosystem, and there are feedback loops and balances and trade-offs, and we need to acknowledge all of that and model all of that when we're doing our planning. Next slide, please. So what can we do about it? Individually, we want to clear out the garbage in us that leads us to experience more of this whatever it is we're experiencing, right? So if I'm seeing conflict out there, that means there's conflict in me. I have a mental framework. I'm seeing my mental framework. I have to clear out the garbage to see what's real. The second thing is discovering that clarity that comes with that. And then claim the good that you wish to see in the world. Remember Gandhi, be the good you wish to see in the world. Claim it, be it. Acknowledge that it is possible and it is present in you and therefore must become present around you. And then act simply in alignment with all of that. Then in community, you do all of that and you articulate together all of that. In authentic community, you can say, you know, I got this issue. When I was a kid, this happened, and I keep getting my buttons pushed, right? And I need people to help me see and deal with that button, right? I can say that in authentic community. I can't say that if I'm the boss or I'm the minister and I'm supposed to know it all, right? Yeah. All right. And then as a group, act. One of the things I was doing in the 80s and 90s was working with communities in Portland. We had, at that time, we only had 190 neighborhood associations. I don't know what it is now. And each neighborhood association was an opportunity for people to get to know each other and care about each other and make their neighborhood be the community they wanted to live in. And that was normal in the 80s and 90s in Portland. I don't think it's normal there anymore because they're too big. But it was normal then. And that gets into a whole nother thing that I have about scale. We don't have time to do that now. And then finally, we get to be parts of large networks of folks. The five ways within the rules, I'm not going to spend any time with. That's the usual get out the vote stuff. You guys know how to do that. With final five voting, we make two simple changes to our elections for Congress. We get rid of what doesn't work, party primaries and plurality voting, and replace it with what will work, open, top five primaries, and instant runoffs in the general election. Let me explain these changes with an example of final five voting in a hypothetical and kind of cool election. So here we have eight candidates from four different political parties. Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Abigail Adams, all the way through to Aaron Burr, ambitious as ever. Immediately, you notice how diverse this field is. It's a primary people would want to vote in because it's exciting. It has experience and vision, but it's also young, scrappy, and hungry. 
Okay, maybe not so young. <laughs> and because this is an open primary, all eight candidates are on the same ballot, regardless of party. When the results are in, the top five finishers move on to the November election, again, regardless of party. In the general election, voters pick their favorite, just like always. But then, if they would like, they can also rank their second, third, fourth, and last choices. You may have heard of this idea as ranked choice voting. Here's where things get interesting. If this election were a plurality vote like normal, Aaron Burr would win because he has the most first place votes, 30%. But because this is final five voting, the winner will be the candidate who's most popular with a majority, not just with a narrow slice of voters. So we use instant runoffs. We drop the candidate who came in last, and those who had marked that candidate as their first choice get their second choice counted instead. The process continues until a candidate emerges with a majority. It's just like a series of runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back for another election, voters simply cast all their votes at once. And after those results are in, Alexandra Hamilton wins with 68% of the vote. Final five voting is the name for this combination of top five primaries and instant runoff general elections. All right. We must change both rules at the same time. Huh. <laughs> right. So that is a direction that people could go. So then find folks who are working, willing to work through the issues. Next slide. <laughs> because there are two groups that I have been finding that are pretty interesting. They're actually inviting people from various different points of view to come together and work through stuff. Okay, so this one is a group that's going around the world, Common Sense American, and they started in Idaho, which is interesting. They started in Idaho uh, to, to get conservatives, moderates, liberals to deal with state politics issues. And they're working at every level and they're inviting people to be part of it. So it's Common Sense American, and you might want to check out their website and see if that's something you want to be part of. Next one. Next slide. This is something I literally just discovered. Um, bravery, you know about Braver Angels. This is cool. Politics has always been a passionate subject, and we've always had deep political disagreements. That's the way it's supposed to be. But we've gotten to the point where people can't even talk to one another. Americans no longer see their political opponents as simply wrong or misguided. They see them as bad people whose ways of thinking are dangerous and incomprehensible. They see them as enemies. This level of rancor and mistrust threatens our democracy, and it makes it harder for us to move forward as a nation, regardless of who the president is. The fact that we live in what feels like, some people call it, a cold civil war, that takes a toll on all of us. We've been excommunicated from a lot of our friends in the last couple of years, and it makes me sad. This is one organization that's doing a lot to kind of overcome that and, and get people back to where we were, which is neighbors, friends, communities. Better Angels was born in response to the crisis of polarization. We are truly bipartisan. From our staff, to our funding, to our board of directors, we're evenly split, half conservative, half liberal. Everything we do comes from the bottom up. We're an almost entirely volunteer-led operation. We wanted to see, could we get together a group of folks who voted for Trump and a group of folks who voted for Clinton and get them in a room together to see how can we bring people together to not get them to agree or to come to the middle, but to maybe change how they think about one another. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of people would look at 2020 and argue that this is the least hospitable time for the work that we're doing because we know that our politics has a tendency to bring out the worst in us. But it also is an extraordinary opportunity because this deeper project of civic renewal, of healing the relationships that exist between the American people across the cultural and political divides, the importance of this project is going to become clearer and clearer to people over the course of this election. A lot of people are going to All be right. I really believe that it's better to do it in a productive So that's who they are. And they're alternately called Better Angels and Braver Angels. So go with me what you want on that. Next slide, please. 
So what I would like you to explore is what you personally feel called to do. And I invite you into a time of silent contemplation. If you want to do that now, we can do that. We have about 10 minutes. Um, and find what garbage needs to go. Who have I been hating and angry at that I need to let go of and not be angry and upset at? And then find that clarity of, well, if I'm not angry at them, if I'm not upset at them, if I'm not demonizing them, what am I doing? How can we be in a better relationship, as these braver angels are suggesting, without those past judgments? <laughs> Because it's very hard to be accepting of one another if I am judging the other, right? Writing and drawing is a very useful tool for this. And, you know, getting together in small groups and then sharing in the large group. We could do that if we had another half hour or an hour, but we don't. What we have is another five minutes. So... I'm going to invite you, if you feel called, or if you have a cl clear question that you would like to have me address, I would be glad to do so. And you can put it on the next slide. Yes. OK, the planet will survive regardless of what humanity does. It will not look like it did before we got here. And it will not be as, um, you know, as humanly supportive as it was, but it will do what it does. You know, even if we did that horrible path of the nuclear war is our way to get to here, it would have. So knowing that, my job, our job, each of us, is to recognize we live in an ecosystem and to function as part of that ecosystem in a way that is as healthy as possible. And there are more and more things like that. And our friend over here keeps telling me, we need to talk about regenerative agriculture, but we need to be talking about regenerative lifestyles. And that's what Rodale Press published back when they first brought that word in to the, the language, was how can we live in a way that regenerates our beings and our world? I get it. So... It, she's saying that she's feeling like I, I've left out the idea of creating a knowledge base for people because they are voting without knowledge. They are acting without knowledge. And I'm going to say to be ignorant in this world is a choice. All of this knowledge is available. Everything we need to know is available. There is no, that the problem is if I have been trained not to look. <laughs> So what I need to do is not make more knowledge available. Yeah, I can do this all day. I do. I write two, three books a year. I do at least 10 presentations a year, and I do Sunday talks. I can make all the knowledgeable knowledge I can get access to available, but if nobody's listening or looking, it doesn't do any good. So what I believe is needed is that shift in internal consciousness in each of us that opens up the possibility of a shift in internal consciousness so that the person will open their eyes and begin to have access to the knowledge. The other piece is, yeah, you know, continue to have everyone who is thinking and doing these things make it available. Every possible social media has this knowledge out there right now. It's on TikTok. It's on Twitter. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. It's on everything except for those really closed up ones out there. Google searches, any kind of search engine. I've actually done Bing as a search engine, which was sad, but I could get some of this information using that. So we used to say friends don't let friends use Internet Explorer, and Bing is just the next generation of Internet Explorer. But all of that kind of thing is, it's out there. What is not out there is, for example, radio stations in Arkansas, Louisiana, and East Texas, where people can hear this, what, or those kinds of things. So I need to find the way to get people to open to the knowledge that is there. And I appreciate what you're saying. I really do, but that that's the where I've come to in my understanding. Because I started there. I also one of my minors was library science. I've built three libraries. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. The guy who wrote that book, The Way Out, Peter Coleman, 
who's been doing a study, and he has found that if he sets aside time and allows the people in his world who he has seen in the way that you have seen this sister who only hears so much and then, you know, whatever, he says, if you allow them to talk until they're done, they sort of run out. They sort of run out. The tape comes to an end. And they don't have anything there. And in that place, you talk about what you have in common. When that emptiness starts. And it, those of you who have done the um, Scott Peck community building stuff, which is part of what I'm writing about in that book, there is this stage. You know, if everyone comes in, oh, yeah, we know each other. We can talk openly. We're fine. We're fine. And then someone says something and everything goes chaos. Right, And then everyone gets to this point where I don't know how to deal with this. In some way, that's what we are as a nation right now. Then there is a place that Peck calls the emptiness, where everyone's going, what do we do next? <laughs> and if you can go into that emptiness with what we have in common, you begin to build the bridge. And that's part of what these braver angels are talking about. Where do we have it? You know, I was a Navy wife. I'm an academic. I grew up on a university campus, you know. I said inner city, but it was right on the edge. University of Chicago, ghetto, <laughs> right there. And um, I'm a Navy wife. What does a Navy wife have in common with everybody else? Well, we got food and kids and houses, right? We've got how our guys are doing, how we can reach out to them, how we can be supportive of them. And that's where I put my energy. And then we got into, well, we all kind of do crafts. Well, we created a crafts fair, you know, and then we raised money for things in the community. And then I started selling Tupperware so that people could get together and raise money to sell for things in the community. It was just, what does an academic do in that environment, right? If we can be where we are together, what we have together, then we build from there. Thanks for asking the question. But it starts with you know, let, not being judgmental long enough for what they have to say to run down, and then you know you have something in common. You know you do something. If only you live in the same block or the same neighborhood or you're, you, you had the same parents. You know, I was describing my, my Trump Republican family, and I was just being curious. It never got in the way of our relationship, if I could just be curious and then focus on what we have in common. I have to let go of my judgments in order to be present to someone else so they cannot have to defend where they're at. Acceptance of one another is a big part of what you use are about and what the new culture is about. And it is four o'clock. And I want to thank you all very much for being here. 